Hello and welcome. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you on this day. I pray that as we join together in worship, in whatever way we join together, that we be united by one spirit serving the Father in the truth of the Son. Let us celebrate the example God has set for us. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning is God of our fathers. If you'll join me in prayer. O Lord, our God, help us this day as we celebrate the example you have set before us. Let us also remember our fathers of faith. Let us recall the ways in which you teach us, guide us, and lead us, that you have shown us how to faithfully follow you, Lord, to be kind and merciful. Let us always be a people of faith in your steadfast love that endures forever so that we may be a people that instill hope in others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reflection today is from Psalm 103 of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. 
He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him as far as the east is from west. So far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We read the words of Psalm 103, and we hear about God's steadfast love. We hear the proclamation of God's goodness. That God deals with us in mercy and grace, that his love is far reaching. How do you feel God's grace? How do you show it to others? How do you experience God's love? How do you help others experience it? How do you proclaim that the Lord is blessed and that the Lord blesses? God, our guardian and guide, protect us in all our days. Help us when we go astray that we may see you and remember your steadfast love. Let us always remember your faithfulness to your people, that your mercy is abundant. Give to us a spirit of wisdom and love that we may share all that you have shown us and all that you have given us. Let us celebrate the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Common English Bible. Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what, he was do- what was going on. The servant replied, Your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I've served you all these years and I never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never even given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I picked the reading for today, a rather familiar reading, as I was thinking about what it means to be a dad. I began to look through the various fathers in the Bible. There's plenty that stick out as sort of the obvious choices. You have the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can look back to the first father, Adam. You've got David and Solomon, and you have a whole variety of people. But it was hard to find one that covered what I was thinking of when it comes to being a dad on this Sunday. And then I started thinking about the prodigal father. We hear the parable of the prodigal son, and we compare the brothers in the story, but I started thinking about it. And the father in that parable honestly reminded me very much of the things I think of when I think about being a dad. I think it is because the story itself shows a father who doesn't play favorites. He's not overbearing. He's not fast to discipline or be angry. The story is about a dad who just wants to help his kids. Being a dad of three boys myself, I can relate to this. So as I began to read, I began to focus in on the father. How often we look at the sons and their actions, and we don't think about the fatherly aspect of the story, even though it is the central part of the story. What we see is a fair and kind father who wants his kids to do well. The first sign of this is when the younger son says that he'd like his inheritance. Now, there are all sorts of ways one can react. Anger over wanting what is not supposed to be divided up until the death of the father. Resentment over such a request. But what reaction do we get? Caring. He divides the estate between the two sons. The younger son leaves home and goes off to do all the things he wants to do. He makes a lot of poor choices along the way. Now at this point, we get an interesting picture of the father. We are often so focused on the sons that we don't stop to think about exactly what the son says about his father. What brings him home is thinking about his father's household. He begins to think that his dad has plenty of people working for him and that they have enough to eat. He remembers his dad has been a fair and kind man to the people who work for him that he's been generous to them, unlike the people that the younger son is working for now. With them, he never has enough, but his father always gave those in his service plenty. And he realizes he left it all behind. So he makes up his mind to go back and to say that he doesn't deserve to be called his father's son, but that he would gladly work for his father. Now, I want to pause on that before we get back into the narrative of the parable. What brings this young man home is that he remembers how well his father treated others. 
Even though he feels he is not fit to be called his father's son, he does think that maybe his father is such a generous and nice person that he let him come back and work. That even being his father's worker is better than where he is now. And it shows that the prodigal father isn't just a man who loves his sons, but a man that showed them how to live, even if they didn't quite grasp it. He isn't worried about going back. There's no worry that his father will mistreat him because his father doesn't mistreat the people around him. His father set an example. His sons might not have realized it right away, but he was caring for others and displaying the kind of things we talk about all the time. Treating others how you want to be treated. Caring for your neighbor. Loving others as we love ourselves. Because of all this, the son realized it was in his best interest to go home. Because he knows his dad is a good person, so he can return. Even if as a servant. Back to the parable. On his way back to repent, the son is spotted from a distance. When his father sees him, he's moved with compassion. He goes to him, hugs him, kisses him. He doesn't ask, where have you been? He doesn't say, where's everything I sent you off with? He sees his son and he's happy. Now to his credit, the younger son tries. He sticks to the script. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Before he can get to the part where he asks to be a worker in his father's house, the father brushes aside his concerns. He calls for a robe, sandals, a ring, everything to mark him as his father's son in the household. He wants people to know, this is my son. He calls for the fattened calf to be slaughtered for a celebration, because to him his son was as good as dead, and now... He has him back, and that is enough. So they celebrate. We could stop here. We've already painted a picture of a good dad. Son comes home, treats him like he's still his son. Doesn't matter what mistakes he's made. Father still loves him and is happy to have him home. End of message, we all go away happy. But it is this next section that really draws me in personally about being a dad. Because if we stop there, we don't get a picture of how he is with his other son. With the older brother, he's been out in the field working and he comes back to a party going on. He asks what this is all about and a servant tells him that his brother is back. That his dad is celebrating the return of his younger brother. The older son is indignant. He is upset. He won't even go in. So the dad comes to him. Now at this point, I have to say that this feels all too familiar for me. Kids have a fight, and one decides he's going to stay in his room and isn't going to come out for anything. I could wait. I could wait for him to come out. Or I could go find out what's wrong. Father in our parable goes out to find what is troubling his son. So the older son lays it all out. I've been here all these years. I always listen to you and that son of yours. That son of yours didn't listen. But you've never given me anything so I could celebrate. Notice he doesn't say in the text, my brother, but it says, this son of yours. This son of yours comes back and you throw him a party. The father's reply is one filled with compassion. You are always with me. What's mine is yours. But how could I not celebrate when this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive? He was lost, but he is found. He was lost to us, but he is back. It is interesting because the father makes a point of saying, your brother, instead of my son. He doesn't get upset with his oldest son. He doesn't yell at him, but he says something very true. 
Early in the parable, he didn't just give the younger son his inheritance. He divided the inheritance between the two sons, meaning that in a very literal sense, the older brother could have celebrated at any time. The older brother is upset that his little brother gets a party, even though he's the rule breaker, and he doesn't think the younger brother deserves it. The father in me relates a little too well to all of this. The dad shows compassion to both sons. He shows caring, kindness, and loving to both sons. He doesn't want his older son to be left out. And that is an important point. He had been so centered on the other son that he didn't notice the older. Had he been so centered on the other son that he didn't notice the older was missing, he would never have come out. But in the midst of celebration, he goes to find him so he'd be included. Which is another great example in this parable. He doesn't ignore either son. He doesn't chastise either of them. He's a caring father to both sons in the story. If the older son had just realized it, he would have been part of the celebration. He would be up there with his father and his brothers celebrating their family being whole again. That he would have been a part of it because he too was an important part of the family. But his dad just wanted him to understand that right now, at this moment, your brother is the focus because they lost him. They have him again. It's important. It is an important dynamic. So often when we talk about this, we focus on comparing the brothers. As I read it, preparing for Father's Day, I couldn't help but see that this father shows the kind of father I want to be. that I want to be the kind of dad that can be there for my kids when they mess up, when they don't want to listen, and that I want to be able to celebrate them together, that I want my kids to be happy for each other and to care for each other, and I want them to see me and say, that is someone I want to be like. That even if he wasn't my dad, I would look up to him. Reading this as a dad, focusing in on the prodigal father, so to speak, it highlights all those things that I saw in my dad, that I remember seeing in my grandfathers. I don't think I can recall a time when I thought my dad had a favorite. I can remember my dad giving extra attention to one of his kids when they needed extra attention, but I don't remember ever having a time where I thought my dad loved one of my siblings more than the others. And there were five of us. I think about that when I think about my kids. What kind of example do I want to set for them so they can be good people? I want them to see the kind of person that honors God, not just in making sure that we say prayers before bed and go to church, but I want them to see a life that reflects God in everything how I treat others, and how I treat them. That reflects my devotion to God and how I live every part of my life. I want them to see me as someone they can always turn to, the way I can turn to both my Father here and my Heavenly Father. So I look at this prodigal father and I see so many things that I hope I can be, that I hope we all can be. That we can all be there for others when they make mistakes. That we learn how to treat others with kindness, compassion, and mercy. That we all strive to be the kind of person that someone in trouble will seek out. Because we are filled with God's love and grace. That we aren't just hanging around waiting to pounce on failures or recall old grudges. That we be people whose lives set an example for others as how to live. That their faith is an example of how to love God in all that we do. That our lives be an example of showing love and kindness freely as God has given them to us. Because those are the things I think about when I think about being a father. Because being a good dad depends an awful lot on being a good example. 
devotion to family, devotion to charity, devotion to love, devotion to kindness, and devotion to God all play a role in being the kind of person I want to see in the world. So I show it to my children in the hope that they will show it to everyone. That together we will be a people of love and mercy, serving God by our inspiring hope in others. That we always be people others can turn to no matter what. That we show others we follow God by showing others how good God is. Amen. If you'll now join me for our prayer of confession and pardon. Lord, forgive us, we pray. We come before you as those who have sinned against you in what we say and do. We come before you as those who have sinned against you in what we do not say and what we do not do. It is in our doings and our failings that we seek your grace and your mercy. We haven't loved you how we should. We haven't loved each other how we should. We are a people who are sorry, who humbly seek your forgiveness. Help us to live with one another in your mercy and your grace. Let us always remember the sacrifice made by our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may understand your deep love for us. May we honor that love by sharing it with one another, loving as you love and caring as you care. Help us to be of one body redeemed by one blood, serving one God. Amen. If you are so moved to make an offering, you may send it to the church treasure or you may send it to the P.O. Box <coughs> Excuse me. listed in the weekly update. If you are interested in online giving, please contact me. We are still the church, and the church still needs your support to keep doing all the important work that we do. And one final note, uh, this next Sunday uh, is set to be the last Sunday that there will be video uh, of the service unless I hear from anyone requesting that we continue to keep uh, the video feed active just let me know if you'll now join me in the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we move to our closing hymn, Faith of Our Fathers.
We go forth now that we may be ministers of the good news wherever we go. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all until we meet again. Amen.